Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Elkanen, along with Brianna Valeski, and we have Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson on the line. He's Chief Investment Officer of Lemelson Capital Management. How are you doing this morning, Reverend? I'm good, Joel. Nice to join you again, and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, be on the show. Okay. All right. Uh, just real quickly, uh, just a recap here of, uh, you know, the, the Greek situation, the resolution, uh, you know, put, you know, put things aside for now, maybe just kick the can down the road, haven't got a lot of recovery um, in the uh, Greek ETF. Just give us your take on the outcome and what you're looking forward, looking forward to. Well, uh, yeah, Joel, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, we, we've talked a bit about it in the past, I think, on our June 5th show. Um, uh, you know, there's been progress towards uh, a deal uh, to fund their next debt payment uh, to the ECB, but it hasn't received final approval. Um, I think, you know, it, it, really the world, uh, the Troika and, and so forth, they should be thinking about uh, writing off some of that debt for the Greeks. I mean, my own opinion would be that I would hope the Greeks would just leave the Eurozone, uh, assert control over their own monetary uh, policy again, reintroduce the drachma. Uh, and get on with business, if you will. Uh, that is to say, default. But uh, for whatever reason, I mean, the Greeks really feel compelled to be part of this Eurozone. And I'm not convinced it's in their best interest. I, I really haven't believed that ever. Um, I mean, it, it looks like a great deal of oppression they're living with, frankly, from their creditors, uh, who have more accountability in the situation uh, than is generally talked about in the mainstream financial media, Germany and so forth. Uh, but if they really are, are, are hell-bent on staying in the Eurozone, uh, I would hope that their creditors would recognize and the Greeks would recognize that this is an unsustainable deal. Well, frankly, I don't really know how the Greeks are going to deal with any further rounds of austerity. I mean, uh, a lot of Greeks are suffering, and it's not nice. I mean, uh, they, 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 I mean, basic things are difficult for the average Greek family. I, I think I, I read a statistic that it's like 40% of children in Greece are living under the poverty line. Uh, I don't know how another round of austerity measures could introduce. I mean, really, something's got to change. And I, I've always said that at the root of this is um. It's really a psychological issue. I mean, it's a sort of post-Ottoman uh, psychological insecurities, uh, which are absurd. I mean, the Greeks have to part with that and stop um, feeling in any way that they have to submit to this uh, this aging debt, which is unsustainable. So uh, if they do continue, let's pray that, they, that some of the debt gets written down because it's having a huge cost, a uh, human cost. And it's always fun when we have guests on the show to kind of, you know, look back. You know, they make your statements, and you certainly make some pretty bold predictions on this show. And uh, we'd like to kind of keep track of them. And when we were talking to you, uh, this was back on a June 5th interview, uh, you talked about NBG, and you said just stay away from this issue. And uh, now it's, uh, you know, good thing, uh, you know, you did. I don't know if it's time to look at it for recovery or not. Uh, yeah, well, you know, um, Joel, I, I think what happened back on the interview is um, I think you had actually brought it up, the NGB issue, if memory serves me correctly, and uh, the shares are down about 36% since then, and um, my retort wasn't specific to the National Bank of Greek as such, but it was just, uh, I think what I had said was something to the effect of stay away from all Greek oh. securities, which would be my position always. I mean, um, uh, the Greek um, capital markets are a low-trust environment, and there's uh, sadly, there's a lot of corruption in that society, and I, I feel very bad about it because I am myself Greek. Um, but it's a reality, and I just don't know why anybody, um, whether it's a retail investor or a large hedge fund manager, would go bargain hunting in a country and in a culture that I don't think if you weren't Greek and if you didn't live there, I don't think you'd really understand it, the way business is conducted there. And so, um, I mean, those calls did wind up being pressured. I, you know, like I said, NGB dropped about 36% since June 5th. And I think the ASC, the asset stock exchange, dropped about 16%. So uh, I, I guess it wound up being prescient. Uh, Father Lemelson, I read a very strange st statistic, and I can't seem to back it up yet, but I was wondering if you had any take on it. Uh, I read that Greece has not paid a single debt since Rome took over on 146 BC. Does that seem <laughs> at all even possibly true to you? Well, I, I don't know enough about history to say, uh, Brianna, but... I can only speak about contemporary Greek society, which I, I know uh, probably more than the average person that, you know, maybe isn't Greek. Uh, and that is that, um, you know, Greeks have a lot of strengths, first of all. They're really entrepreneurial. They're visionaries. Um, uh, they, you know, in my mind, of course, they have really the, 
the, the treasury and the romance of Christian faith and orthodoxy. They have all these wonderful things in their society, but I kind of wish from time to time the Greeks would take a page from the playbook of America and, and the West in general about doing business in a high-trust fashion. Uh, because if you look at the underlying um, uh, cultural uh, norms, if you look at the sort of the, the MO of the Greek people with tax evasion and so forth, I mean, Greece is a funny country. I mean, you go to Greece and you'll see streets that are falling apart, the infrastructure's falling apart, and it's not uncommon to see, you know, uh, you know, a, you know, a Ferrari or something near parts of the street. So Greeks independently have in the past been quite wealthy, but have very little sense of the common good, unlike um, their Scandinavian counterparts or Northern European counterparts that have a sense of, well, let's take care of the community first and individual families second. But that doesn't exist in the collective consciousness of the Greeks. Um, and you know, I'll tell you, one area of, of uh, Greek business that I, I was involved in for a while was the dry shipping business, looking at that, analyzing those securities. Greeks still uh, control an, an inordinate uh, percentage of the world's dry ship goods through these shipping companies. And, and they've got really quite the jig, because they're based in Athens very often, or just outside of Athens, these companies, but they have their vessels all uh, licensed in like, no-tax jurisdictions and in jurisdictions where there's no such thing as shareholder rights. And if you look at how they conduct their business, these, these uh, companies, I mean, it's really just a, the worst wealth transfer you could imagine from common shareholders on American uh, boards is to, frankly, these owners. And uh, the way they, they can, it's just indicative in, of how they view um, shareholder rights and fiduciary responsibility on more of a micro level. Uh, so if we, if we contemplate where we're at today with Greece, the society as a whole on a macro level, how do they conduct themselves in the public markets for securities and capital formation? It's not hard to imagine that that ethos might have existed for a very long time. Whether or not it goes back to the Roman era, I don't really know, but um, you know, Greece has changed a great deal in the pre versus the post-Ottoman era. But we are where we're at today, and it's not a safe market to invest in. All right. Well, let's move on. Um, I know you don't love the short uh, issues, but sometimes it just, you know, you're looking out for your investors and you see something. And Legan Pharmaceuticals is an issue that uh, you've been shorting. And, uh, you know, you've got it to come. My first question is, I mean, so what? because obviously this stock, when we talked to you in June, it had a considerable run up to over 110 do you just, when it has, yeah. yeah, it had several, it looks like it had one, two, three, four, five, six, almost 10 up days in a row. It, when you get into a position yeah. like that, do you, do you just sell a little bit more each day and more quantity or the higher it goes, you sell more? Um, how, how do you how do you manage a trade like that? And then, you know, talk about what's going on with the stock now and what you're looking, uh, looking for in the future. Sure, uh, Joel. So, um yeah, I mean, ligands dropped about 16% in the last four trading days, uh, which is pretty precipitous. Um, I would like to have shorted more around 10. I, frankly, I ran out of money. I mean, I just there's always more ideas, ideas here at Lemelson Capital than capital. Okay. Um, it just doesn't come in fast enough, new capital. Um, but, uh, you know, we did double our short position on June 4th. Um, and it, had we had more capital, we would have kept shorting the stock um, as it went up. I mean, we, we, we've talked so much about uh, why those reasons would be. I mean, as you recall, we covered our short position last fall around $40 a share. Um, we originally shorted at only 68 It was really a large return. Um, it worked out well. I mean, I didn't really know the stock was going to double after that. So, I mean, the timing was <laughs> worked out well. But I couldn't believe it as it kept going up to 80 90 $100 a share. I thought, well, nothing's really changed in this company. I mean, they've got tremendous customer concentration. They've got tremendous concentration in their key product lines. Uh, the, the, the executive team is, is just printing uh, and issuing stock for their own benefit. Um, and to that end, I think without going into all the details, why we shorted ligand pharmaceuticals in the past and why we continue to be short ligand today, um, you know, just a cursory review. I mean, anyone can take a look at what's the management team themselves doing. And they're just dumping the stock as fast as they can. I mean, if you go back to almost a year, I mean, going back to, uh, uh, you know, well, I was the beginning of this year, let's say. Every single executive of that company is dumping shares. I mean, you've got John Fabian selling perpetually. You've got Charles Berkman selling. You've got Matthew Ford, the COO, selling. You've got um, Melanie Herman, the CFO, the interim CFO. She's dumping her stock. Jason Arrieta, the director, he's dumping. And Nishan De Silva, the VP of Finance and Strategy, you know, he's dumping. And we've got Sunil Patel, another director, he's dumping his stock. Um, you know, why would you buy into a company? 
where the, the, the people closest to the company inside can't sell their own shares fast enough. I mean, Warren Buffett doesn't sell shares in Berkshire Hathaway for any other purpose than to give to charity. Uh, and he hadn't over four or five decades. Why does this management team, that's hardly a year into having a company that's not, not even solvent, frankly, to include the, uh, the secured debt, the bond offering, why are they all selling? And you look at the valuation metrics, I mean, my own opinion is that it's part of an extraordinary bubble in biotech. There's a number of bubbles out there, and biotech's clearly one of them. We've been in this unusual and uncommon monetary policy for a number of years now. It's inflated prices. Um, there should a company with 18 people, essentially two viable products, even those products have severe competitive threats, um, and really like 80 or 90 percent of their revenue derived from just like two customers. Should its company in that precarious a position with hundreds of millions in debt and, and very little uh, liquidity, should they be trading at these sort of multiples? Should they have downside a, a target? Billion dollar market cap? Downside target? Well, we I've always held that the company has no intrinsic value, frankly. Okay. I don't value in a company with those sort of uh, operational risks, uh, financial risks, uh, and risks just generally to the business model. Okay. I want to so, go back to our January 28th interview, um, and we were sure. talking about Alibaba. And uh, I'm not sure who wrote this story, but uh, the story we had on Benzinga, the, this hedge fund manager says, stay away from Alibaba. Um, at the time, it was over the $100 level. It's now under, now it's in a 71 handle here. Uh, is it time to turn around and maybe get a little interest in Alibaba? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say, Joel. Alibaba, I think, has lost about 30% of its market cap since then. Uh, my chief concern with Alibaba at the time is just why buy an IPO, and, and of all things, why buy a Chinese IPO? <laughs> when the market for IPOs heats up in any market, whether it's China or America, you're probably in a bubble. I mean, IPO activity slows down as market prices adjust and rebalance uh, or are perhaps even undervalued. But when you've got an IPO machine in any public marketplace, uh, you can be sure that investment banks are making a lot of money from marketing issues to a retail investing public. And I think what we're seeing now in the rise of China over the last 15 years, when you finally see the public markets for capital formation, when you see the average Chinese person, like a farmer or something, putting his life savings into the public markets for securities, um, the investment banks and the marketers have won, essentially. And, and, it's, and again, it becomes a wealth transfer, right? So you're bringing money from insiders in the company who know a great deal about it. They're sophisticated operators. They're very shrewd. And they're transferring their shares to somebody with a lot less knowledge. And um, that's not nice. I mean, and I think it really is. It's, you, you can say, like, maybe this is the top sort of for the Chinese market. I mean, maybe it's just going to go down from here because you see this evolution in China from First, going from low tech to high tech manufacturing, and and then really trying very quickly to build uh, their financial markets. The government played extraordinary roles in that by supporting liquidity in the markets and allowing enormous amounts of margin debt. I mean, unlike the U.S., a smaller percentage of the Chinese population is invested in their stock market, but still, it's a very very scary situation. And uh, you you ask yourself again, like we talked about back then, that why would a company like Alibaba feel compelled to come to the U.S. to IPO? I mean, why not IPO in their own markets? And the answer is there's a lot more liquidity and there's a lot more retail investors, of course. So I don't think it's that expensive like an Amazon or something like that, but it's certainly not cheap. And, um, you know, the, the Chinese economy and the Chinese way of doing business is not particularly mature. I mean, capitalism has lived in the U.S. and in the West for a very long time. Uh, in China, it's, it's relatively new, keep in mind. I mean, 15 or 20 years, really, of, of capitalist evolution is not a very long time in the greater scheme of things. And the way they do things, um, it's boring to us. It's exotic. So, for example, what happened to Yuan uh, yesterday, uh, you know, who would have seen that coming? And and you look at these press releases from these uh, Chinese companies, they're really very different than the press releases on earnings for the U.S. companies. They talk in great deal about what they're doing. They use a lot of non-GAAP measures. Um, but they don't provide all the financial information. Um, Which is very their... important, very important. Let's move on to lumber liquidators. And we had you on the show uh, back in March. And uh, you had actually, I think um, you had actually spoke with the chairman of the company. And it was trading around the $41 level. And uh, some of your comments were it's not cheap, low operating margins, little liquidity, ballooning inventory. Did you get down and dirty on the short side in it? Or are you looking maybe, is it looking a little attractive down here to you under $13? Uh, that's a great question, Joel. You know, the thing with lumber liquidators, yeah, I, I did have a chance to talk um, with what's now their interim CEO as well, since their CEO uh, suddenly departed the company. Um, I think that, you know, I, I didn't have to reveal any problems in the company. I mean, 
that was done by the 60 Minutes program and, and Whitney Tilson. Um, but I think there was a perception once it, it, right after the first drop that maybe it was a value. And I think it was really a value trap, actually. And if you just look at the financials, you could see that. Um, you know, and, and it's lost, I think, 70% since we had that show um, and we talked about uh, the company. So it's really been... Uh, well, let's, okay, well, let's get some predictions. I mean, you've been pretty good here on these other ones. Let's get some predictions moving forward here. And uh, we know that you have a <laughs> you have a big stake in uh, Apple Computer, and I, I know your price target's a little bit higher than where we're trading now. Uh, lost it's a, a lot higher. <laughs> yeah, lost a 200-day moving average here, quite the haircut here. Uh, trading, we did yeah. trade down to 109.63 here. You're getting a little nervous on the Apple position. No, Joel. It's pretty extraordinary, though. I mean, you see a company that size, what is that, 50, 60 billion in lost market cap or something, maybe more in, in just like a week or something or two weeks. It's really extraordinary to see the ball today. I think that's because Apple attracts a lot of uh, speculators and retail investors and who knows, quant funds, I don't know. But you're talking about the best brand in the world, arguably the, the finest run company in modern economic history, uh, if not ever. Um, there's nothing wrong with that company. X Cash, the Ford P&E is 10. It's almost half what the S&P is trading at. The, you know, every business is growing except for their iPad business. And, and, you know, in a way, if you look at what's going on with their services business, it's as big as the iPad business now. Nobody seems to be noticing that. Um, if you look at their bill of materials um, and their purchase commitments for this upcoming quarter, it's higher than it's ever been. And I think the, the 6S and the 6S Plus, when they're released, I think they'll just keep breaking sales records. I really do. Um, there's just an enormous install base for iPhone, um, which is, you know, their chief revenue generator uh, globally. And you're just going to see year-over-year year increase. I mean, it's really weird to see a company that, that grows its revenue year-over-year, year, you know, in their last quarterly earnings report. I think it was something like 35 or 37% and to see the company sell off. And there's just this huge disjoint between what the financial pundits are saying and what's really happening at the company. WWE. So, uh, you know, if you, if you look at just the actual financials, why would you sell Apple? I mean, it's just printing money, if you will. Okay. Well, we're going to follow that one for sure. WWE, do you still have your one share? <laughs> yeah, we still have one share. Yeah, that's... You know, it's, it's pretty interesting. DTIG released a research report putting a strong buy-in the company. I think a $27 price target. I have to chuckle. I mean, because the underlying financials of the company continue to erode. Uh, you can't apply a Netflix multiple to WWE. It's not Netflix. Right, uh, even well, Netflix is wildly overpriced. So, why? Um, overall thoughts on the market here: uh, trading range in the S and P's, uh, bouncing around like a yo-yo here. Uh, our last guest said we could be having up as much as a fifteen percent correction in the market. Uh, what's your thoughts on the overall market? Yeah, well, there's not a lot of drivers. I mean. Uh, uh, to push things higher. I mean, interest rates are going to go up. That will have a negative effect. And, um, you know, buybacks are played out. I mean, Alibaba enough to buy back, but to me it looks like a, you know, a day later and a dollar short. Um, those, those are those are stimuluses to the market that are running out. And we said for a long time we'd, we'd rather have a big short book uh, for the rest of 2015. We're doing that. So, uh, you know, you, you could just pick a, I mean, if we, you know, if you were to take a look at the shorts we've discussed on the show, um, you know, they look like, uh, you know, we've talked about Ligon, and we've talked about Netflix, we've talked about Skechers. Um, those are companies that have wild valuations. Uh, it, you know, any bump in the road and those come in the optimism relating to those issues that will affect their popularity. I think they'll have precipitous fall. So, I sleep better at night being short. Uh, a lot of those sort of names that are very Sketchers, very popular. You take and even some, even Apple's unpopular. You're, yeah, you're taking ahead. some pressure and taking some heat in the Skechers here, huh? Well, no, I, I consider it an opportunity because we're still shorting the company. Okay. So every time the price goes up, I, I feel like a kid in a candy store. i got to tell right. you, Joel. We'll keep uh, an eye on it. We've been on the line with Reverend Emmanuel Lemonson, Chief Investment Officer of Lemonson Capital Management, going over some of his past predictions and uh, what he's looking for in the future. Thanks a lot, Reverend. Great to have you on, as always. We'll talk to you again soon. Great joining you guys. Thanks again for the invitation. Take care.